As I mentioned before, this is, this is Palm Sunday. Um, it's the beginning of what we call Holy Week. Um, as a reminder, we won't have services here on Wednesday night, but we will have on Thursday night. On Monday, Thursday, when we traditionally observe communion and, and foot washing. <coughs> It was not the first time Jerusalem had been flooded with people shouting Hosanna. That was Passover. It happened every year, with branches representing victory. Pilgrims would stream into the gates, prepared to recite together Psalm 113 through 118, including the joyful greeting, Hosanna, Lord save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But this was different. The rabbi on the donkey was a sensation, a worker of true miracles, and a teacher unlike any other. It was said he had raised a dead man back to life. Surely he had the power of God. Those fortunate enough to see him entering the city shouted out their greetings and made the way more beautiful by laying down their cloaks and branches as they would do for the most honored of men. That was Passover. That was the celebration of the blood of the lambs. God kept his word, and the angel passed over their sons in Egypt. How many hoped this man would be that angel of death for the Romans? How few understood that he was, instead, the lamb. The lamb whose blood would save them from sin and death. Had they known, would they have gone silent? Or would they have joined us today, shouting more loudly still, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Most of you probably know that lived in Florida for quite a few years. And, and we really enjoyed living in Florida. It's not that we didn't, but I, I don't think I'd ever go back there anymore because it just takes too much money. And, you know, pastors are not typically rich guys, so probably won't ever live there again. But there was one time of the year when it really kind of came in handy. And that was on Palm Sunday. You see, when you live in Florida, it's always easy to decorate for Palm Sunday because palm trees are everywhere. So I can always break off the, the palm fronds and decorate the church with it. I want to, I want to read to you this morning uh, John's account of, of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And, and this is a little bit different because it, this was from the New Living Translation. And it leaves out that word Hosanna, which I, I really like, but uh, they use something else. But let's just see how they, how they word it. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet Him. They shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the One we went like three slides at once, didn't we? <laughs> Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into His glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about Him. 
man in the crowd and seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. And they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after Him. And with those words and that thought, Jesus' faith was sealed. Palm branches throughout history have, have been a symbol of victory. coming of Jesus into Jerusalem, the people were almost euphoric. You, you see, they had been under the control of, of, of the Romans for, for years and years, and they saw in Jesus a new king, a new king that would lead them to their independence. They waved these branches as a symbol of what they hoped would be a victory over their oppressors. Well, I love to win, don't we? Well, I like to be on the winning team. I remember when I was young, I just wasn't a sports guy. Now, I got better as I got older. I kind of found my groove when I played softball. But I just wasn't a sports guy when I was a kid. And part of the problem, I think, was that my eyesight is pretty bad. You know, that was before I had glasses, before I had, before I had contacts or anything. And I couldn't see well enough to hit a baseball or sink a free throw. For those of you who grew up and were good at sports, you don't really know what it's like to always be the last person chosen on the playground. I'm sure that's the way the Israelites felt. They, they, they had been dominated by the Romans for so long, they were just, they were just looking for, for any way out, any way that they could be a winner now. And they saw this Jesus ride into town. They, they saw this prophecy fulfilled as he was on this, he was coming in on this donkey. And the people were excited. The people were yelling and screaming. They heard the stories about the miracles. They heard the, about the miraculous signs that had, that had followed this Jesus around. <coughs> and they thought, finally, finally, we have somebody. We've got somebody to lead us. And they saw a victory and their future. And, and, and it's good when, when, when you're on the team and you can just smell that victory, you know? You're, you, you, you get a good lead and, and, and you're ahead and you think, oh man, this is going to be great. They thought, we can be winners again. And they weren't winners. They just, they just didn't know it yet. but it wouldn't look like the victory that they had imagined. You know, victory can look different in different situations. I, I'm reading a book right now called, by uh, Jim Putman, and it's called Church is a Team Sport. And he maintains that even though we see many churches growing in number, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're winning. And he says in the book, many say winning is about numbers. We want converts. They say, wrong. Winning is making disciples. Converts who are discipled on God's team and taught to take part in Christ's mission. Numbers don't mean much unless you're counting the number of people being transformed by the Holy Spirit. It means unless we're seeing lives changed, we can fill up this room and really see no results. 
So this morning, we're going to talk about victory a little bit and what a victory might, might look like in our lives and in our church. Next slide there. First, a victory always needs peace. Have you ever really went, went, to, went to war with someone? And when it was all over, it didn't really feel like a victory. I saw a video clip a while back at, at a baseball game. And I don't remember exactly where the two teams were, but they were... They were, they were older kids. They were teenage kids, you know. Uh, when it begins to make a difference to you, you know, not like the little ones who don't keep score. I always wonder, you know, what's the point of having a game if you're not going to keep score? But they were bigger kids. And it was this championship game against uh, uh, two of the top teams. And, and the team that was in the field was one out away from the victory when the last batter stepped up to the plate. And the only thing that made this situation any different was that even though they were on opposing teams, the batter and the pitcher were best friends. And they now faced each other. They were on the opposing teams, but that doesn't affect the friendship. Well, at the end of the game, the pitcher was victorious and he struck out his best friend. And as all of his teammates rushed out onto the field to, to celebrate, jumping up and down and giving hugs and high fives, that pitcher walked straight up to the mound and embraced his best friend. You see, it didn't feel much like a victory to him because he knew his best friend was hurting. The very first praise that the angels announced when they told about Jesus is glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. See, they promised us peace because of Jesus. I've been in a struggle before, not necessarily a hand-to-hand -hand battle, but a battle of wills. And, and let me tell you, that's that's ten times worse. That's more damaging. You, you could have a fist fight with somebody and, and walk away no more scarred than you will in a mental battle. When we were kids, we'd fight, and, and, and the next day, we'd be good buddies again. But that's not the way it works now. One person has his or her opinion, the other person has theirs, and ultimately somebody loses. If it occurs in a church, it usually means that the person who loses leaves. Sometimes they take a lot of people with them. And that's never a positive thing. If there's a battle within a family, oftentimes people are hurt. Sometimes one part of the family will be estranged from the other part of the family. Hey, have you ever won and then really felt badly about it? If you have, then what you experienced wasn't a true victory. Any victory that we have in Christ will come with positive feelings and a positive outcome. Philippians 4, 7 says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace of God which is more than we could ever understand. I've probably seen the miracle of God's peace at work more than any other attribute of God. I've seen broken people who've gone through life's tragedies and exhibit the peace of God and their lives. When you know God's peace, nothing can stop you. Nothing can break you from His presence. No situation can ever separate you from that. Secondly, victory must be measurable. 
Luke 14, 27, 28, Jesus says, And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Or who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's even enough money to finish it? See, there's, there's always a cost for everything. That's why everything is measurable to a certain extent. You know, in the church, it's really hard to measure a victory. You can kind of measure it in attitudes of people. But, but it's really hard. I followed an old pastor one, one time who said, I won't be happy until everybody in town is saved. Now, knowing people and knowing what I know about Cross at Arkansas, which is just like any other town, I'm pretty sure we're not going to ever see a 100% salvation rate in Cross it. I think I'd be happy if we just see an increasing number of people coming to church, an increasing number of people giving their lives to the Lord. But, but there always has to be some kind of way to measure how effective you are. Now for me, I used to be a, a dealership technician, you know, for Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company loves to survey. They're big on the survey. You, you know, if you've had your, your vehicle serviced at a dealership in, in the past few years, you probably at some point received a survey in the mail concerning your experience at the dealership. And, and, and the questions, there may be some questions asked concerning the, the technician. That would have been me. They, they did things like, did the technician fix your car right the first time? If the answer was no, then that wasn't a good point for me. Everything was tracked from my efficiency to how effective my repairs were. And it was, it was pretty fair. But, you, know, you always get those people that won't be happy with anything. You know, that would, they would answer negatively that, that would affect your pay sometimes. But sometimes you try to track things in the church. And the reason it's so hard to track things in the, in the church is that people often misrepresent their experiences. People attend, as I've said before, for a variety of reasons. And not all those reasons include worshiping God. It, it, it's really difficult to measure what's in a person's heart. Because many times the, the person will want the, the pastor or, or church leader to believe that they're more spiritual than they really are. So the only way that I can really track spirituality is, is through commitment. You know, there's really only one thing that we really all have some of. And that's not money, because I don't have a lot of money. Probably a lot of you got like more money than I do. But we all have time. We all have time to spend. And it's the most precious thing that you have. Your time. It's the only thing in the world that we have a certain amount of. And, and that we can't really affect a whole lot. Or we can diet, we can exercise, and we can quit smoking, and we can do all those things that we think are bad for our health. But even then, we all have a certain amount of time. And our day will someday come when this time on earth will end. So that means most of us love this time. We love these, these experiences we have on this earth. We love this life. And we choose how to spend it. How you choose to spend your time says volumes about what's really important to you. If you love to bowl, I'll probably see your car over at the bowling alley quite a bit. Because you love it. If I like to golf, probably I'd be parked out at the golf course. And of course, if I love God, then the church is going to factor into my plans more often than not. And finally, 
victory must be complete. When I was younger, I used to be a big fan of boxing. I love to watch guys box. What happens if you're boxing with somebody and, and, and your opponent, you, you ever see the, see the guys and, and man, he starts to he starts to get in two or three good punches and you look at the other guy and you know his eyes are kind of rolling back in his head and he's you know he's staggering around a little bit. What does the other guy do then? Does it, does he usually back off so he gets you know, oh, I'll let the guy have a little time to rest? Nah. You go in then with that left hook and you finish off your opponent. You try to end the battle. Joshua 10 and 8, the Lord said, Do not be afraid of them. The Lord said to Joshua, For I have given you victory over them. And here's how we know it's complete. Because not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Nobody will stand up to you. Most often, the battles for the Lord are complete victory for those who continue to follow it. Things that happen to Jesus this week in history in no one's world look like a victory. The crowd went from shouting Hosanna and praise God to crucify. Everything that happened this week was part of a master plan by God the Father. From every thorn on that crown, from every lash from that whip, from every strike by a hand to every word of scorn from those people, to every strike of that hammer, heads of those nails. It was divine intention. In Matthew 26, 53 and 54, Jesus says, Don't you realize that I could ask my Father for thousands of angels to protect us and He would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the Scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? In the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, God the Father achieved what He had been working on for thousands of years. From the time that man had disobeyed, and from the time that man had distanced themselves from God, the Father had been working to restore that relationship. He used countless people along the way. He used some people who were very close to Him, and, and, and had his intentions in mind, he used some people that, that were far away, who believed in the wrong type of things. Nevertheless, the Lord never stopped seeking us. He never stopped loving us. He never stopped longing to call us his children. suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but He died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but was raised to life in the Spirit. When something is done, and you know it's done, it's a victory. Jesus' death on the cross was a victory for us. It was complete. It was total. We don't need to do anything else. We don't need to sacrifice anything. We don't need to do anything. But accept Him into our hearts. How are you today? 
Do you feel defeated? Because sometimes I do. Some, sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I feel as though I have the weight of the, of the world on my shoulders. Sometimes we feel as though nothing's ever going our way and, and there's nothing that we can do to turn things around. Today, this Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, the, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem in victorious fashion can be a victory for you. Because you see, the battle's already been won. The enemy has been defeated for you. And all you need to do is claim that victory. All you need to do is invite Him into your heart. Today I heard you come. I urge you to come and pray that God would claim a victory in your life. I urge you to, to pray for someone that you might know that's defeated, who needs the peace of Christ in their life. Why don't you come turn it over to Him today? As we sing. 165. Let's sing.